Hello, my name is Neil Davidson and I'm the founder of Raw Amber Studios. Welcome to another online drawing session. This session mimics the structure of a regular life drawing class. We'll show you one or more photographs on the screen and it's your job to draw what you see. We'll have an artist joining us, giving hints and tips. You can either follow their advice or do your own thing. It's entirely up to you. You can watch this video again once it's finished and you can also download the reference photographs so you can carry on your work after the session. Lots of people watch these sessions twice. The first time round they just watch and then the second time round they watch and draw along. I hope you enjoy the session. Right, let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome to this latest Raw Umbra portrait tutorial. In this tutorial, I'll be drawing a single one hour pose. And in this pose, I want to recap the main proportions of the face, looking at how they relate to each other. And then I want to take you all the way through finishing a single one hour portrait. So first, let's talk about the materials. I'll be using some willow charcoal on Bristol paper. This is a fairly smooth paper. And then using the willow, you can hold it like a pen, like I'm doing right now, or you can hold it at the very end, locking your wrist. And what's good about this is it allows me to lay down very long lines. This is great for the beginning of the drawing. When I hold it like a pen, it makes the marker a lot darker. It's also harder to draw a nice straight line. So just at the beginning of the pose, try to remember to lock your wrist and use your whole arm to place these lines. In addition to this, I'll also be using some compressed charcoal. This is more for the details later on. And finally, it's useful to use a blending tool. And this can be anything from a brush to a stump, your finger, or even a piece of tissue. And all of these materials can be found in the materials box below the video. And now, before we start, I want to use some old willow charcoal just to tone my paper. And what I'm basically doing here is rubbing my charcoal all over to gently tone it to a neutral grey. And as you can see, this leaves a little bit of texture. So what I can do to build up this tone is take a bit of tissue or kitchen roll and gently rub this into the paper. And you may have to do this a few times because every time the kitchen roll does take off a little bit of the charcoal. But the goal here is to be able to erase into this ground, which helps make the highlights later on in the drawing. And what's really great about a putty rubber, especially these grey ones, is that you can erase large areas, but also knead it so it becomes very fine. It's perfect for details. If you don't have a putty rubber, you can also cut a little bit into a normal eraser, which will make it a bit easier to make precise marks. And so basically, the start of the drawing is that we have three values or tones. We've got the darks of the charcoal, the mid-tone of the paper, and the white that we can get by raising into the tone of the paper. Now 
All right, so let's get started with the actual drawing of the face. And the first thing I always like to place is a center line. And it's the line that goes all the way from the middle of the forehead, through the middle of the nose, to the middle of the bottom of the chin. And one measurement system I really like to use for these videos is a system called comparative measurement. And what this means is that if I place the line of the brows anywhere on my center line, just roughly following the direction of the brows, which are more or less horizontal in this pose, and then I can place the nose where I want it to be. And this is going to be the first measurement in which I'm going to compare everything else. So for instance, if I'm looking at the nose, to the brow, I can see it's roughly the same distance as the bottom of the nose to the chin. So I can measure this on the actual photograph and then just copy this measurement out on my paper. And this is called a vertical measurement. I'm comparing verticals to each other, but you can also compare a vertical to a horizontal. So for instance, if I look at the light shape on the right hand side of his eye, I can see that's roughly the same length from the center line as it is from the brow to the bottom of the nose. And that's really all that comparative measurement is. You're comparing every area to other areas, seeing how many times does it fit and is it the same length, is it shorter or is it longer. So let's practice this with another area, for instance the other cheekbone to the center line. Now because he's turning away, this is a little bit shorter than the side that's turned towards us. And I can see it's roughly half of the size and the width of the right hand side, or maybe even closer to a third of the length. So as you can see, by dividing these lengths into quarters, halves or thirds, you can then find the width or the length of other areas. Now of course you don't need to measure constantly. Your eye is actually quite good. Everyone can see when something doesn't quite look right. So try to trust your eye first and then measure afterwards if you're not sure if it's in the right place. So now coming back to the center line, we can see how the side of the face compares that center line. For instance, I can see that the chin almost touches that vertical line from the middle of the brows. And I can also see that the forehead turns inwards as well. Now it can be very tempting to now start putting in features, but first I want to make sure I've got the whole of the skull on the paper. So I'm just measuring the back of the head here, comparing it to my other measurements. And I can see that if I draw an imaginary straight line from the brow, and the nose towards the back of the head, I can see that the ear sits somewhere in between these two. So as you can see, comparative measurement is a little bit like a puzzle, 
I'm constantly just comparing these shapes, keeping them quite blocky and quite general until I know where everything should be. And this is also why this part of the drawing is often called the blocking. So I've got most of the bottom of the head. I can just use the comparative measurement to find the top of the head and then finally round off the skull. So I've now got the block in, in for the bigger areas of the face and now I can start breaking down the smaller areas, so the features. And a good rule is always working from big to small shapes and this helps because of course you need to figure out these bigger shapes in order to be able to place the small shapes. So even when I start breaking down the features, I'm going to start working from big to small. And the first thing I'm trying to find here is the eye line, so the corners of the eyes. And I can see it's about one third down from the top of the brow compared to the bottom of the nose. And keep in mind the symmetry of the face here. The brows, eyes and nose, as well as the chin, should all be pointing in the same direction. And the first thing we're going to do is draw the arch of the brows, going from that center line all the way to the outer corner of the eye. And this brow overhangs the vulnerable eyes, of course, and protects it a little bit. And one thing to note about this is that because it overhangs, it means it sticks out a bit. And this means that the eyeshadows will most of the time be in shadow, or at least a darker tone. Similar to a box. The light is hitting from the top, the area of the box that is in the shadow will be turning downwards. And the same principle applies to the skull. So even though of course there are highlights inside of there, for now just ignore these and look at the big shapes first. And I'm just going to gently tone these two eye sockets down, knowing that they're actually going inwards. Next on the outline, we can see the cheek actually poking out of the skull again, so the cheekbone actually comes out before it turns back in towards the chin. And these are called the planes of the face. Basically what we're doing here is imagining we're sculpting, instead of again drawing all the details straight away, looking at these big sculptural planes. Try to imagine what's going up towards the light and what's going down and away from the light. For instance with the nose, we can see that the bridge of the nose is angling outwards and is catching some light. And the side of the nose and the bottom of the nose are both turning away from the light. And as you can see, the nose is a bit more narrow towards the tip, and a little bit wider towards the outer nostrils. So I'm just using the eye socket to drop two vertical lines down to find these outer edges of the nose. And this can be very personal to the model. So some people have a wider nose, some people have a more narrow nose. So using the eye socket to measure this can really help with the likeness. So 
So I can do the same thing for the mouth, roughly dividing the eye socket into two equal halves. And I can see that the corner of the mouth sits about halfway if I drop it straight down. And then to complete the final piece of the puzzle, I can look at where the lips are situated and a useful measurement here is to divide the bottom half or the bottom of the nose or the bottom of the chin into three equal parts, with the lowest part being the mass of the chin and the upper part being the bottom of the nose to the dividing line of the lips. And again, of course, this is very individual, so you might find that you see it slightly different. But I'd like to start with these three verts and then see how the individual changes from these standardized measurements. And again, just looking at planes here, which bits stick out and which bits actually recede. And then drawing the lips, I'm doing the same thing, looking at the two main planes. With the top lip, we can see that it's widest near the nose and gets a bit more narrow towards the corners of the mouth. And the top lip is another down plane. So if we're looking at the face from the side, we could see that the top lip is turning downwards towards the floor and the bottom lip is actually turning upwards. This will be a lighter plane. So if we draw this from the side, you can imagine that there'll be shadows for the top lip, the bottom of the bottom lip and the bottom of the chin. And for those of you who would love to have a look at the planar heads, we do have one in the resources. So feel free to have a look at the plane ahead later on if you'd like to have a look at all of these different planes and how they sit on the face. In the meantime, I'm just going to break down the drawing just a bit more. And if you have any questions at all, of course, feel free to ask me here in the comments if you're watching this live. So when I'm speaking about planes, I'm basically just trying to look at the box of the head. And if I draw a little box here, on the side of the drawing, the light is coming from the left, we know that the plane that is turning away from the light will be in the dark. And this of course goes for the face as well, and we can see this really clearly for instance on the side of the nose and the side of the cheekbone.
So I'm just gonna quickly cover all of these areas that I see are turning away from the light. And the instinct may be to leave the ears, for instance, quite bright. But keep in mind that it's still on the darker side of the face and the skull. So even if you do see areas that are lighter, for now just ignore these. We're still looking at the big changes and the biggest change of all is the light in the front of the face versus the darkness on the side of the face. And now I'm almost at a point where I've got my big block in, in, I've got most of my planes in, and I could start just cleaning up some of the drawing. And note that when I'm erasing, I'm actually using my finger or a blending tool, because at this point I don't want to bring highlights in yet, I just want to go back to that grey toned area of the paper. Now before we can start rendering, just the last note about information in the shadow. As you can see, I've mostly ignored it. And this is because later on, I'll be doing some more smaller changes in tone and value. But for now, I'm mostly focusing on these big changes, keeping everything quite simple. But one exception is the hairline. Because it's very useful to see the way the hairline sits versus the brow and the eye socket. It helps me judge if I've got all my measurements correctly. So with the hairline, there's always a little block of hair just in front of the ear. Then there's a area of hair that follows the outside line of the brow. And then finally, it joins up with the front of the hairline. And this is very useful because it allows me to measure the side plane of the head, which helps me place the features in the head because sometimes the features can be shrinking or growing and they don't actually sit in the skull quite nicely. And like I said at the start of the video, I really want to focus on placing the features and measuring in this video. So I hope that you're not sick of this blocky approach yet. I promise we will get to the rendering and the softening later on. But for now, I'm going to continue breaking things down even further. And I'm going to start with the eyes.
So looking at the corners of the eyes, I can see that they sit roughly in that middle one third between the nostril and the corner of the mouth. You can imagine that the eyeball, of course, is a round sphere. You don't have to actually draw this in, but I like to just at least imagine the sphere sitting there. Then you can see the lid sitting on top and rounding around the sphere of the eyeball. With the fold of the top lid being near the top of the eyeball. And the iris taking up about a third of the total mass of the eyeball. So the same thing on the other side, making sure of course that the corners of the eyes are in line, as well as making sure that the top and the bottom of the eyeball are in line as well. So symmetry is really quite important. Of course, everyone has small differences in the face, but I find it so much easier to first look for the areas that are symmetrical and then later I can render. And as I do so, everything moves a little bit anyway. Whereas if I start with things that look a little bit different, then it's very easy to start getting out of hand, so it's very easy for stuff to start moving. So always focusing on symmetry and measurements first before I start rendering the pose. Alright, so now I've got the eyes in, I can move on and start adding some planes for the nose, starting with the nostrils and the tip of the nose. For the tip of the nose, it's useful to think of it as a diamond shape with a pointy area that slowly rounds in to the bottom of the nose, so the down plane of the nose. The nostrils will always be a little bit higher than the middle of the nose that connects to the lips by the philtrum. And 
And the philtrum is basically this little triangular shape that connects the middle of the nose to the two top points of the middle of the lip. And you can imagine that this area of the lip can be another heart shape. So point it at the top and more narrow towards the bottom. And this is another shape that everyone does have, but in some people it's more pronounced than in others. So it's a very individual shape. The bottom lip will always be a bit more narrow in terms of the width compared to the top lip. And when drawing this in, I like to switch to masses instead of lines, because of course we don't want to give him lip liner. Instead, I'm just using a tone to indicate the end of the lips. It's a good idea to look at overlaps near the outline of the mouth and look at how the lips overlap each other and how then the moustache curls around this again. And this is particularly important with a three quarter head because everything is very clearly visible near the outline. Alright, so up until this point, I've really only been worrying about the measurements and the construction. But of course that doesn't actually make for a finished drawing, it's merely the foundation. So for the last bit of the pose, I just want to worry a bit more about rendering and how to finish this constructive portrait. What's important here is to look at the way planes turn when rendering. So for instance, if you look at the cheekbone, of course it's not chiseled at a 90 degree angle, it's actually going around a bit softer. And the softer something turns, the softer the radiation from one plane into the next. And you can do this simply with a stump or another blending tool. Sometimes when blending like this, you can lose the sense of the different planes. So sometimes what I like to do is just go over it a few times, blend it in, reinstate, and then re-blend until I feel like the values and tones have been built up enough. Same thing for the forehead, you can imagine it going round quite softly and so I'm going to try and add a gradation near that edge of the plane.
And you can see quite quickly the portrait starts to turn and starts to feel a little bit less blocky. Now, if I'd be softening everything equally, the drawing would look a bit too blended. So it's key to alternate these plane changes. And so in addition to softening some areas, I'm also going to sharpen other areas. Like for instance, what I'm doing right now with the nose. And it's a good idea to alternate this as much as possible. For instance, with the eye, I can use a line to indicate sharpness around the shadow edge, and I can blend to indicate softness. And the more I alternate the two, the more the drawing will start feeling like skin. And one way I like to start this is by losing something completely. For instance, for the brow here, I can use a blending tool to lose the shape completely in the softness. And then I also want to pick out another area next to it that's really quite sharp and clear. And this sort of sets the boundaries of soft and hard plane changes in shapes. So for the lid, for instance, it curves around quite softly. Then the fold in the top is quite clear, so I'm going to bring this out using lines. And really all I'm focusing on is the way one tone gradates into another tone. And this goes for the darks, but also for the lights. For instance, for the bottom lid, you can see there's a very clear boundary. If you compare the top of the bottom lid to the iris, but then around the bottom of that shape, you can see it's actually quite vague and quite soft. So again, that's another place where I can alternate these hard and soft gradations. And as you can see, the more you do this, the more realistic the drawing starts to become. And this is really where your artistic prerogative really comes out. How much do you want to soften? How much do you want to sharpen? If you like a more sharp drawing, it will look a bit more graphic. And if you have a softer drawing, it will look more atmospheric.
So I'm just going to spend a little bit more time going around the edges of the notes. Just doing the same thing, alternating these hard with soft edges. And in the meantime, if you have any questions at all, feel free to ask me here in the comments if you're watching this live. And the instinct can be here to really want to draw in all of the details and the sharp edges. But sometimes it's a better idea to actually lose something. For instance, if I look at the forehead, I can actually lose some areas of the forehead into the background. And this makes it actually look more realistic and less like it has an outline around the face. For the hairline, it can be very tempting to use a harsh line because we can see it's a different texture to the skin. So you want to really show that, but actually that can make it look a little bit artificial maybe, because actually the hair slowly gradates out of the skin, it doesn't start suddenly. So often what I like to do is just blend the two into each other very roughly and then later maybe pull out a few accents. So actually losing shapes into each other can make the drawing feel more realistic and more natural. And this goes for any shape but extra for outlines. And so a good rule is to lose the outline where it goes outwards and keep the outline where it goes inwards. So the cheek comes out, which is where I'm filling the line and even losing it in some places. And then I let it be in the areas where it goes downwards and inwards towards the mouth. You can do the same thing for other areas, for instance the nose or the lips or any other area that you see.
Now at this stage you may also want to start looking at some texture. For instance the beard has a different texture than the skin of course. And what I see a lot of students do is start drawing every single hair in. But this actually pulls a bit too much focus to that area of the lip. It makes it look a bit drawn again. So instead what I do is first look at the big gradation of tone. Keep it really nice and soft. And then once I've got that big gradation in, I can use my lines to just add a few hairs along the outline of the shape. And this gives enough indication that there's a different texture going on without putting all of the attention, all the detail to the beard. So whenever I'm finishing, I'm first looking at the big gradation of the shape. Then I'm looking at soft and hard edges. And finally, I look at accents. Same thing with the lower lip again. You can imagine it goes round as it goes downwards. So this is where I can put a big gradation of tone. And look at the softer edges. And again, for the beard, I try not to get lost in the individual hairs. Instead, I'm just adding a few accents around the outline. Now it's really easy to leave the ear white because again the instinct is that it's a different shape so you want to differentiate it from the rest. But when I actually squint at the image, the tones of the ear are very close to the surrounding tones of the hair and the neck. So I'm just going to glaze over this with my charcoal 
and then add some accents on top. And this last stage of the drawing is also where I start adding some highlights. And this is again a very personal thing. You may not want highlights everywhere. I tend to only put them in the areas that I want the focus to be. So around lips, eyes, and maybe a little bit in the nose. Finally, I also like to use a compressed charcoal to add some darker accents in this focal point. And this will be the last few marks that I make on the drawing. And while I'm doing this, again, if you have any questions at all, feel free to let me know in the comments. And otherwise, I will speak to you near the end of the pose.
right, so that's the end of the pose. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope that you feel like you've learned something about measuring, as well as the planes and the structure of the portrait. If you'd like to show off your work, feel free to use the photograph button here in the chat, or otherwise use the hashtag, hashtag RawUmberLive on Instagram. I hope you enjoyed the session and thank you for taking part. Don't forget to photograph your works, put them on Instagram and hashtag them with hashtag raw umber live. We run two sessions a week, a portrait drawing session every Sunday at 4 p.m. and figure drawing every Wednesday at 8 p.m. The last portrait session of every month is free. Thank you and goodbye.